Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, the third session in American English Live Teacher Development Series 17. We are so excited that each of you are here with us today. My name is Kate, and I'll be with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, Elena, who will be the moderator helping answer your questions and responding to your comments during the session. Let's begin today with these wonderful audience comments from our most recent webinar, Using Visible Thinking Routines in the Language Classroom with Stephanie Bolaños. <clears throat> so Patricia in Peru wrote, I feel this session was of great value since these visible thinking routines will help enhance the development of critical and creati creative thinking in my students. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you for that great comment. And we have Mohammed Ismail in Afghanistan who wrote, this webinar will help me teach my students and create a motivating, encouraging, and collaborative learning environment. Awesome, we're so happy to hear that, Mohammed. And finally, we have Jane in Kenya who wrote, visible thinking routines will impact my language teaching skills in a way that will deepen my learners' understanding of texts, character traits, and themes in literature class. This is huge. Awesome, Jane, thank you for sharing that. We love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development. So please continue to share your thoughts about our webinars by offering your thoughts um, through the end of session quiz form or by emailing your ideas to American English webinars at FHI360.org. We may feature one of your comments during the next session. And throughout series 17, we are exploring the themes of critical thinking and inclusive practices in ELT. We hope you're able to use the practical ideas we share. And here's what to expect today. The session is about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments as well. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. So please share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. When our session comes to a close, you'll have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. And once you've successfully passed the quiz, you can expect to receive your badge via email within about a week. And before we begin, we wanted to make sure you know about one of our upcoming massive open online courses, Teaching Grammar Communicatively. In this free MOOC, participants will explore how to adapt grammar instruction for students' needs in the EFL classroom. Participants will focus on how to integrate grammar instruction with teaching language skills, learn more about task-based grammar learning, and evaluate different and error correction strategies. This self-paced course is open now until enrollment closes on July 24th. Use the link being shared by the moderator to learn more and enroll today. And now for today's webinar, <clears throat> Building and Sustaining a Culture of Belonging. Researchers have reported students' sense of belonging has been strikingly low internationally, even before the COVID-19 pandemic. Creating the conditions for students to experience a sense of belonging and feel fully affirmed in who they are is the best way for teachers to personalize any instruction in any context. In this webinar, participants will explore activities and practices to build student-to-student and teacher to student relationships in a language class context that affirms students' identities and improves students' sense of belonging. By the end of the session, you will have developed an action plan to regularly use at least one relationship building strategy in your instruction. And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Lindsay Lyons. Lindsay is an educational justice coach who works with teachers and school leaders to inspire educational innovation for racial and gender justice, design curricula grounded in student voice, and build capacity for shared leadership. She has taught multilingual learners in New York City public schools, holds a PhD in leadership and change, and is the founder of the educational blog and podcast, Time for Teachership. 
Wonderful. Welcome, Lindsay. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Kate, for that great introduction. I am so happy to be with you. So let's begin by defining a culture of belonging. So how I think of a culture of belonging is that every student and every teacher is feeling appreciated and celebrated for who they are. They feel connected to and supported by the adults and the students at the school. And something that they do not experience is a need to defend their human rights or to feel unsafe at school. I'd love to hear from you before we actually get into anything else. I want to know what you think, um, why you think, excuse me, a culture of belonging is important in your specific ELT classes. Yeah, let us know, everybody. Why do you think this is important? Why do you think a culture of belonging in your classroom, in your school is important in your context? Let us know. Let's see here. So that students feel more confident and successful from Natalia. Wonderful. For safety. Absolutely. It makes students feel open and comfortable from Joelma. Definitely. There's better communication from Ting, great. It helps students to express their identity from Aung, very nice. It makes students feel at home to share and express their ideas from Farhan, wonderful. And let's do a couple more. Students feel they are important, absolutely. And it encourages a friendly atmosphere from Regional English Language Office in West Africa. Hello, everybody over there. All right, thank you so much for those great ideas, everybody. These are fantastic ideas. And actually some of them are things that I was thinking about as well. So one of the things that I think is so important when we're learning another language is that we need to be able to talk to each other, to share ideas, to make mistakes and to take risks, right? We experiment with new language or ways of, of saying something. And that requires that sense of safety, absolutely. In this session, we are going to do three big things. One is to explore strategies to co-create class agreements with your students. The next is to explore whole class activities to build relationships with your students. And then the third is to create a plan for how you will regularly use one strategy into your instruction. So let's start with a practice activity. I call this human thermometer, and this is an activity you can actually use with students. Basically, you're gonna share a statement and invite people to move to one side of the room or the other, depending on whether they agree with the statement or they disagree. And then of course, you can invite some people to share why they're standing where they are. Today, we are not in a physical room, but we will use the chat and the numbers one, two, three to determine where you would stand if we were in a physical room. So, our statement here is, I regularly use relationship building activities in class. This could mean absolutely any way that you build relationships. So a couple very small examples could be asking students about how their weekend was, or maybe how they feel about a story that they read. So feel free to enter into the chat the number one, two, or three. One meaning you disagree, you don't really use those activities that often, three being I use them all the time, and two, maybe somewhere in the middle. We would also love to hear why. What makes you say that you disagree, agree, or are somewhere in the middle? Yeah, let us know, everybody. How much do you disagree or agree with this statement? And um, this is a great activity and one that I'm sure many of us are thinking about ways to use in our classroom. So this is a fun um, example. <clears throat> Excuse me, I see a lot of threes coming in. 
Wonderful. And you can please feel, say, uh, feel free to say why as well. Giselle says for bonding. Joelma says three because it adds value and sense of belonging. Beerman says two because time is limited. Absolutely. Time constraints definitely get in the way. It makes learning easier to build relationships from Pierre. Pierre. Uh, Farha says um, three, because they can relate everything that they learn and to enhance their critical thinking. Wonderful. Juan Pablo says three, because the students feel comfortable with the teacher. Awesome. And Manuel says three, because it helps students to feel comfortable to engage. And one more. Victor says, um, agree because it helps improve speaking. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. So many comments coming in. These are amazing. And you all can probably teach me some things because you're doing all of these great activities. Fantastic. Let's try another statement for this human thermometer activity. This one is, I have time to build relationships during class. So I know this was something someone already mentioned in the comments, definitely something on our minds. So if you feel like you do have time to build some relationships during class, um, feel free to agree with that with a three. If you do not feel like you have time to build relationships, you can share a one or two would be somewhere in the middle. And if you have any reason for standing where you are standing in this, feel free to share that as well. Yeah, let us know everybody. Do you have time to build relationships? We had one person say it can be difficult. Absolutely. Um, that is a true statement. Time is always uh, important and limited as teachers. Echo says two because time is li limited. Absolutely. Uh, Sabina says three. She has time. That's wonderful. Joelma says my time is quite limited in a large class. Absolutely. With many, many students, it can be difficult. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> Gulham said, or Gulam says three to maintain the environment uh, and make to maintain the friendly environment is important. Three because teaching one hour classes on a daily basis. So uh, Mujahid feels that one hour is a good amount of time for him. And let's see. Tef says two because there's not much time. Wonderful. Thanks everybody. Beautiful, thank you all for answering. We'll do one more of these. And this statement is my students talk or engage in a student-led activity. It could be a writing or group activity for at least 75% of each class. Now I want to say there is no right answer here. So please do not feel like you should be doing this every class. I'm just curious to see how how many people would agree, disagree, or be somewhere in the middle? Yeah, let us know. This one can be a tricky one, but don't worry. Any answer is okay. Let's see. Um, do your students talk or engage in um, active uh, language skills for 75% of each class? What do you think? Valentina says two. Depends upon your planning from Aish. I see a lot of twos coming in, only in their groups, if I'm able to do groups from Joelma. One from Mujahid, that his students are uh, off, often engaged in more lecture style. Great. Two, because time is limited from Ramona. Dewey says two, because their English is very low. I have to help them when they speak. Yep, definitely. Two, it depends on our lesson plan from Kain. And the US Embassy in Ghana, hello everybody, says two, about 50, more like 50% of the time. Thanks for sharing that. Amazing. These are really, this is a hard thing to do, right? These are great responses and make total sense to me. The 75% comes from a book, Street Data, where they talk about what they call a pedagogy of student voice. And they say it's a nice goal to be able to have students speaking and talking for 75% of the class. I definitely did not do that every lesson. And so it is just something that has been on my mind 
to think about as we plan our instruction. And our activities today will help you think about ways you might increase the percentage. So culture of belonging. I love the idea of thinking about how we might feel in our classrooms and how our students might feel when they're in our classroom. So this is from a checklist that I use when I coach teachers to assess their curriculum, instruction, class culture, and you can use it to kind of measure yours. For example, you can pause now to think about how many of these listed teacher feelings that you feel when you're in your classes. And you can always invite your students to share what feelings that they have while they're in your class as well. Now, it is completely normal if you don't always feel these positive emotions. This would be like the best day of teaching ever. But some things that we might want to look for as teachers, do I feel trust with my students? Do I feel curious about my students? Do I feel hopeful for my students, for myself? for the, how well this class will go. Do I feel successful? Do I feel a sense of joy and peace? Do I feel effective as a teacher, right? And do my students feel pride in their work? Do they feel effective? Do they feel joy and love and connection? Do they have a sense of curiosity? They're always asking questions. And do they feel a sense of peace, which I think comes with safety, which people had mentioned earlier. So just take a moment to kind of think to yourself, do I feel these? Which ones do I feel? And feel free, of course, at any time to answer in the chat with, with your thoughts as well. I also like to think about in that same checklist from the last slide, what might it look and sound like to be in a class where we have a high degree of belonging? So this is from that same checklist, and I've bolded the two items we'll specifically talk about today. But student interests are gonna inform what and how the, the learning happens, right? So how they're learning, what they're learning about. I saw in the comments that people, some people in this group already do that, which is fantastic. That is hard to do. Also that students are sharing what could be different about the lesson. So we just have a lesson, and then we might ask the students, what did you like about that? What could have been different, right? That's a hard thing to do as a teacher. Other things that a culture of belonging might look or sound like include teachers and students talking about students' strengths. What do they do well, right? A lot of times as teachers, we focus on what we need to help students with, what they need to improve or get better at, but they have so many things they already do well. So a culture of belonging includes talking about those things, those strengths. Also co-creating and referencing, referring to going back to class agreements. So how do we exist with one another in this class? And we'll talk about these last two today. All right. So now that we've set the stage, let's get into our first goal of the session, exploring strategies to co-create those class agreements. If you're used to giving the rules, which I think in my experience, that was exactly what teacher school told me, was you give the rules and the students will listen to them. It can be very hard to shift to students helping make the decision about the rules. And for my students, when I would ask them to help me create the rules, they also were saying, no, you're the teacher. You tell me and I will listen or not. So it was a very big shift to making the rules together as kind of a team. But what I found in the research is fascinating. Research actually shows that when students help make class decisions, they experience a greater sense of belonging, which is why we're all here. Right? That's the goal of the session better grades so their academics actually go up, better relationships both with teachers but also with other students, and better mental health. And so if you're feeling like this is a big shift, 
I encourage you to start really small. So you might ask students, can you describe a time you were in a conversation and it did not go well? What rules or agreements could have made it better? And then that's a really great opportunity to start the conversation. Students see why it's important, why you're talking about it. And almost everyone has probably been in a conversation where it did not go well. And they can think about that and participate even without a lot of prior knowledge of what a rule might look like. To co-create class agreements, you may wonder, couple things. When can I do this? What is the thing we're actually creating? What, what's the physical product? And how often do I refer to it or reference it once we have created it? I think you can do this at any time. So many people might be at the end of their school year or even finished with their school year um, thinking, okay, I'll start this next year. Even if you started this in the middle of the year, I think that's totally fine. It's never too late, but I love it as an activity to begin the year um, or before trying your first class-wide discussion. So you're getting ready to have this class discussion and you might say, okay, we want to know how we discuss with one another, especially if we might not always agree, right? How do we do that? And that's a great opportunity to start co-creating those agreements. I also think if you have a class discussion and you totally forget to talk about class agreements, it is a wonderful opportunity to do a reflection on the discussion and say, how did that go? Maybe not great. And let's learn from that. So what would we like to do different next time? And I think a great physical product is a poster on the wall. So if someone breaks an agreement, what I would do in my class is just be able to point to the poster. And I like to number them. So I could just even hold up like the number one. Oh, you, you're violating number one on the poster. And then we can all look at the poster and know what we're talking about. And it's such a quick way to reference it. It always kind of lives there. How often you check in, I think at the start of every big class discussion, you could just point to the poster, have a student read off the agreements, and that's it. It could be a quick 90 second kind of two minute activity as just a quick reminder. Wonderful. We have some nice comments coming in. Um, Let's see, Irada says, class rules make students more responsible and motivated, great. And Irina says, um, classroom contacts are a, or a code of behavior created by students are very helpful. We create them at the beginning of the course. And so Bia Allah says, students become active, wonderful. Um, let's see, and I, let's see one more thing um a poster is a visual reminder and tool for defending your behavior from nadeja very nice thanks everyone i love these ideas keep them coming in the chat absolutely so sometimes it is helpful to think about what does this actually look like i have been in so many adult meetings where we come up with these agreements and I'm still confused at the end by what we agreed to because they're very broad. They might be a one word like respect. And so I think a good agreement is very clear about what it specifically looks like to achieve the goal of respect, for example. So my goal in my class, and this is something I start with, so I would actually share this, but you can co-create this with students as well. I share my goal for our class is everyone feels like they belong. And then I ask, okay, how do we do that? What does it look like or sound like? So some example agreements, and this might be prompted by asking students when we disagree, because that's the hardest, I think, time to communicate. If everyone's agreeing, it's probably gonna be a pretty easy conversation. So if we're disagreeing, what does it look like to still make sure 
everyone feels like they belong. One example could be ask, what do you mean by that? So if someone says something and a student feels upset, they might just say, instead of yelling back, they might say, what do you mean by that? If your words hurt someone, you might say, I'm sorry, right? That's a sample agreement that you might have with students. When students are feeling big emotions in a conversation, when they're disagreeing with someone, you might have an agreement that says, when you feel those big emotions, pause, and then think of a word, a color, a sound that describes how you feel. You might, if you feel big emotions, take a deep breath and count to five before you act or say something back to the student. These are some examples of specific ways we achieve that goal of belonging. How I invite students to make sure that we all agree, because that's important, right? We should all agree to the, the rules that we have. I use fist to five. And so I invite every student to show me on a scale of zero to five with their fingers, how much they agree. So if a student shows me zero, that means these are really bad. I do not like them at all. If they show me five, these are really good. The best rules I've ever seen in the world. If they are somewhere in between, the key number is three. If we have three or more, then we have agreements. We can live with it, right? But if it's below three, if any student shows a two or less, then we do not have complete agreement and we need to talk more. So I might ask the student, what exactly, which one, which rule do you not like? And how might you change it to be able to get to a three so you can live with it? I think another example of this is a thumbs up, thumbs down, which would simplify this activity. Thumbs up, I agree. Thumbs down, nope, let's keep talking. Wonderful, thank you. We have some nice ideas coming in. Maham says, I think agreement should be in class routine when everyone is given a space to contribute a sense of belonging. Very nice. Victor says, pausing and taking a deep breath is very helpful. Absolutely. And Giselle says, sometimes shared agreements can be difficult because teachers and learners are trying to abide by a set syllabus. Do you have any recommendations or one question I had about this was, um, how much time do you spend on this? And is it okay to take more time or less time uh, when you're doing this activity in your class? Wow, what a great question. Thank you for that. And so my response is probably going to seem like a lot. My technique and my strategy was for one whole class period, this was the focus. Usually it was like in that first week of school. So we're kind of doing those introduction activities, but I would do it as one class because I found the more I put in up front in the conversations, when we talk about what our agreements are going to be, it actually was practice for using the agreements because we might disagree with one another and we're practicing talking to each other. And so we actually kind of work out some of our issues or um, struggles with communicating in that conversation. And I found it saved me time later on. So imagine all of those class discussions that I know I've had where it kind of goes off of what the plan was and students are disagreeing and then you have to spend time resolving any sort of upset feelings that takes away class time. And so I found that putting in the time up front, even if it feels like what a whole class period, it actually saves me time the rest of the year. So that's my strategy. But to your question, Kate, I think absolutely if you do this in a 10 minute activity, it's still more valuable than not doing it. Wonderful, thanks so much. All right, so how do we actually do this thing, right? What does it look like to spend an hour talking about this? 
So here are my ideas. I'm going to share two on this slide and two on the next slide. And the first one is called circle. So you would literally sit or sometimes people stand in a circle and you would pass a talking piece. It might be like a little ball. Um, it could be a, a small rock, whatever it is, something that when you get it, you get to speak. And when you don't have it, you have to wait. And every student has a chance to share. They of course can pass, but they have that chance to hold the talking piece in their hand and share one idea for an agreement for the class. And then as a teacher, you might be writing down these ideas. Another option is write around. This might be where you put a guiding question on a chart paper. So the example on the slide here is, what will we do if someone is upset during class? Then each group gets the poster. So group one might put their ideas on the poster and then group two can add their ideas, but also comment on group ones. You might have, let's say you have four groups. You might have four posters with different questions that prompt students to think about how they would disagree with one another while being respectful and creating that sense of belonging. So you'll continue so that all tables or all groups are gonna get those questions and everyone gets to respond. The next two I like because they're helpful when you want students to share, but not be influenced by what another student said. So I have definitely been in a space where someone shared an idea that I was going to share, so I just didn't say anything. These strategies allow you to collect everyone's thoughts and recognize the patterns in students' ideas because they're not influenced by what someone else said. One, if you're in a virtual space or you're learning online, you could have all students type in the chat. I call this chat waterfall, but they don't hit enter. So they don't send it right away until you tell them go. And then all the students press enter at once and you see a bunch of ideas flying through the chat. And that way you can see the patterns come up. Another idea is if you have enough paper, you could have students write on a small piece of paper their one idea, and then they could crumple the paper up into a ball and toss it at the front of the class. This, of course, would need some rules so that no one is throwing paper at anyone else. But then you would have a student volunteer maybe unfold all the paper and write the ideas on the board. So it just gets them moving. Some kids really need that outlet to be able to throw a piece of paper. Of course, if this is scary to you, I understand. And so an option might be to fold the paper and pass it in. I'd love to hear from you at this point, which strategy, so we talked about four, which strategy do you like best for co-creating agreements in your class? Yeah, and we have a lot of comments coming in about how these are great tips and that you can learn with fun. Absolutely. Let's see, Valentina says the chat waterfall. Great. Um, what other things do you like? Mohammed likes the circle and you can always tell us why you like it as well. Group two, the, the second one about in groups is the best option for Myra, wonderful. All of them are productive from Gunel. I would definitely go for Smash It from Farhan. All are amazing from Jessam. Beerman says tossing the paper is funny and crazy, so he would like to do that one. Great. Right around for, for, from Faree. It's a good idea, and I like that tossing activity uh, as it will make students excited and fully involved from Tanvir. Wonderful. All are good, but three is so effective from Adenon. And Johnny also says uh, chat waterfall. Thank you for sharing, everybody. Thank you so much. I love hearing how you're processing these ideas and what will work in your class because you know your students best. All right, let's do one more question. Do you have any 
questions or worries about using any of these strategies, feel free to share those in the chat. Yeah, any questions about these strategies or any worries about them? What do you think, everybody? I see a lot of people very excited to use these great strategies. So let us know if you have any questions or concerns about them. Let's take a look here. No, nope, I, right now I'm just seeing even more people saying other ideas that they like, like group discussion is very good. Um, maybe an example for the smash one from Mohammed waterfall uh is my favorite tossing paper is great um and Jareen says no questions I like them all looking forward to using them let's see one thing from Relo West Africa we like the writing strategy because it will encourage shy and reluctant students to express themselves wonderful thank you I think we can go ahead and move on. Thanks for those great questions, everybody. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And yeah, to Mohammed, to your example, I think I would literally just ask them what's an agreement that you would like to see. So instead of verbally sharing, they would just write it, crumple, throw it. And the directive I would say is everyone maybe stand up if you're worried about them hitting someone with the paper. Stand up on this side of the class and we're all going to throw it to this side of the class. That way there's no one in the way. So that's something I would recommend. <laughs> all right. Oh, I see another. Do you mind, Kate, if I share um, an idea for a question in the chat? Great. Um, so I see Perna, any ideas for a large class? This is such a good question. I have taught very large classes and still use some of these strategies. The written ones, um, like chat waterfall or the smash it idea work best because that way you're not taking up the time with all the voices but you still get to see all the voices just in writing form i hope that helps awesome. thank you so now let's explore some whole class activities to build relationships with students one thing that i think is fascinating in the research is that student teacher relationships of course they benefit students they benefit student attendance, their engagement with class, and their academic achievement and grades like we, we spoke about earlier. But this is my favorite part. They also increase teachers' job satisfaction. So it's good for students, but it's also good for us as teachers. You are probably already doing a bunch of great relationship building work. We heard that from you in one of the first questions. So I'd love for folks to share what's an activity that you do right now to build relationships with students. Yeah, what whole class activities do you do to build relationships with students? What do you think, everybody? Games from Ben, wonderful. Discussion methods or role plays from AFSA. Shahanaz, um, let me see here, Model Elementary School. Hello, how are you all? Uh, let's see, every activity is good to build relationships. Um, other people are saying games, morning meeting with the students from Monmon. Voting for uh, agreement, wonderful. Talking about daily life before starting the class, casual chats from Saw. Hey, Saw, how are you? And role play and learners group. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Excellent ideas. I love these. So I'm going to share a couple with you. One is a resource. It is called Values in Action. And they talk about values like character traits. So I actually included on this slide a picture of my classroom wall when I was teaching students who were new to the language. And I would use these to build vocabulary. I would have them all up on the wall all year. And you can introduce one category each week. So you can kind of see there, there's actually six categories. And you could use the words as you point out what students are doing well. So for example, I may say, 
you know, um, Farhana, you're doing a really good job asking questions. And so, you know, you're being very curious right now. I love that you are demonstrating this value and a point to the wall. So I think once you introduce them, you reinforce that by praising students and telling them what they're doing well using the language. Also how to use it is that you can help students learn about themselves and others. So I love the idea of an appreciation board or an appreciation note or an activity where students are sharing, maybe turn to your left and share something um, that is a value you saw that student doing this week. And they get to talk to each other, share a value, that you have demonstrated this week. We also might be reading a story and we might say this character, what value are they demonstrating? So you can have students use the values in this way as well. There is on the website a survey reflection and questions. So you can also use a ton of things that are on there, but I would just use the ones that I have listed and found it very helpful. Kate, how else might this be beneficial for an ELT classroom? Yeah, one thing that comes to mind about how this could be really beneficial in an English language classroom is vocabulary. I mean, it's really, you could really reinforce these vocabulary words about values by keeping them up and displayed in the classroom and also referring to them over and over uh, throughout the school year. And you could also even help students to elaborate and explain as the year goes by. Um, and they're really developing those um, thinking skills, but also those speaking and writing skills too. So th that's one way I see this is really valuable. Thanks so much, Kate. This next activity is my favorite instructional activity. I would use this once a week, and this is called Circle. So the general setup is that everyone sits in a circle, including the teacher. You could stand as well. There's usually a centerpiece. I love asking students to help create it. Sometimes I would just ask, write the name of a person that you care about. And they would write it on a small piece of paper and I would tape all of the paper together. And that would be what we put on the floor um, in the middle of the circle every time we had a circle. So if a student is kind of being distracted, they can look and see this name of this person that means so much to them, kind of refocus their attention. There's usually an opening ceremony. This could be very short. It could be asking students something like, how are you feeling right now? It could be asking someone to read a quote on the board. Then you'll ask the main question, or you can have more than one and you would pass the talking piece around. Students can say pass if they don't want to speak. And then there's a closing ceremony. Same thing, short. It could be something when we used to come close to running out of time, I would say group clap. We're all clapping at the same time. And we would just all try to clap at the same exact time. And that would be the end. It would be one very fast way to end, but we're doing something together. So another example of how to use the circle is the values appreciation. I kind of spoke about this before, but literally stand in the circle, have everyone turn to the left and share out loud to the whole class. What word can you use to describe the person standing to your left? And you could use that values wall and ask, you know, why did you choose that word? What did they do this week? Another example is a storytelling circle. So my favorites are story of my name. You might say, um, I'm going to put up some prompts or sentence starters on the board, but I just want you to tell us about your name and they can share anything about their name. Some sentence starters might be my name means, or I like my name because, or the person who gave me my name is and share that story. Everyone has an idea about this. 
And so there's no prior knowledge required because everyone knows or feels something about their name. So it's a great introduction activity at the start of the year. You also might say, a time when I demonstrated this value is, so again, using those values and the value all. Sentence starters for this one might be, I showed kindness when, or the character trait that best describes me is, blank, and then share why, because. The final one I wanna share is an academic circle. I love these because you can build relationships and content knowledge at the same time. So if you're feeling pressure to fit everything in, you have to cover too much content, this might be for you. I know I felt a lot better doing this when I felt the pressure to cover all the content and I didn't have time to just build relationships. I realized I could do both at once. So let's say we're talking about a story we read. We can invite students' opinions about that story. They're talking, they're sharing a little bit about themselves. We're building relationships by doing that. And they're still talking about the text that we needed to read. One example that I would share is I would invite students to make a connection and I will give four options. So you could choose any of these connect to a personal experience or story you have, connect to a different story you read, or maybe something happening in the world today. Connect to another text, and I use text very broadly. This could be a movie, a song, um, any kind of like image, art, or connect to another class that you have in school. At this point, I'd love to hear from you again. Which strategy do you like best for building relationships in your class? Yeah, what do you think, everybody? We have so many great comments already coming in. Korna says, wow, storytelling is excellent with a rose added. Very nice. Um, let's see, Manuel says, what I love about these activities is they encourage self-awareness, self-appreciation, and students are more likely to engage and appreciate others when they do it for themselves. That is a wonderful, wonderful comment. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the circle activity is new and sounds really effective from Maureen. Wonderful. Um, let's see here. Um, the circle is the best one from Nayeb. Um, Storytelling activities from Mithan. Habib has a, has a question. Um, should you use these strategies often or just occasionally? What would you say? Great question. Personally, I use them the circle format once a week. So I would vary it between the storytelling type of pure relationship building and the academics. So I might do one relationship building circle a month and then the other maybe three circles for that month were academic circles, but you can choose whatever ratio works for you. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, that we are having a waterfall of appreciation for all of these great um, activities. I wish I could read everybody's, but we love to see how, how excited you all are about these activities. So thank you so much to everybody who shared. Yes, thank you. I think one other thing I want to name is we will want to plan for any sort of conflict that happens. And so the last thing I'll kind of share before we move to our third piece is kind of a bonus. So if there is a conflict between students during the year, I'd like to feel better being prepared for that. So this is a bonus strategy that I use for healthy conflict resolution. This is when students have not gone with the agreements that we agreed on. Something um, happens and a student becomes upset. So in my class, students have the choice to actually ask for a restorative conversation after class and they would actually use it, which surprised me. I did not think that they would want to do this, but I would have students who said, I'm having a conflict with my friend, maybe something I didn't even know about, and they would say, can you have a restorative conversation with me after class? And they would like repair the relationship. It was beautiful. So basically what this strategy is, is having four main questions. Anytime there is a conflict or someone becomes upset, 
you can use a talking piece just like a circle, but this might be with just a few students. This might be with two or three students who had a conflict, either in class or something else that they want your help with that happened outside of class sometimes would happen to me and, and they would ask me for help with it. So you might ask, what happened? Ask both or all three, if there are three people, uh, students to respond. How did you feel? So after both have responded to the first question, you move on to the next one. And then you would ask the third question, who was affected? And then you ask them to solve their own problem, basically. So you say, how can this situation be repaired? Or what do you need from this conversation? And often the students are wise enough that they knew what they needed. So similar to our strategy with values, we can get practice with this without our students having a conflict, but we might look at a story we're reading where there is conflict and imagine what would the characters say? So actually having students pretend to take on the roles of characters and have this conversation as a class or a small group is a great opportunity to practice this strategy. And you can also make like a poster or a little handout for students with these questions so they could reference them in, in their own life, right? Even outside of school if they needed to. Okay, we've accomplished the first two goals and now let's get to the final goal of the session. A big question for me is how do we make this actionable and sustainable? So it's not something we do once and then we don't do it again. Here is one tip I use. I like to put things on the calendar. So right now, picking a date or a lesson to start. I also love kind of a weekly or daily pattern. So for example, I shared circles. I used to do those every Monday. My students would come in on Mondays and say, we know it's circle day. Or Fridays, I would write my values appreciation notes for students. That was a way I would never forget it because it's just what I do on Fridays. Another tip I like to use is strategy stack. So if there's something you already do that might pair well with one of these strategies, merge them together or stack them together. For example, anytime you discuss a text, you might say, I'm going to do this as a circle. Anytime you talk about character or plot analysis in a story, you might say, I'm going to use the values in action wall. Anytime there is a disagreement in a student group, you could say, I'm going to try restorative conversation questions. So these are ways to do what you're already doing and just stack on a strategy you learned today. Making time for more relationship building or student discussion activities can be a big shift especially when we're told we don't have a lot of time, we have to cover all this content. We've spoken about that today. So this might be a helpful way to look at the choices we make as teachers. Author James Clear talks about linking our habits and our practices to our identities to make sure we follow through. So I changed some of his questions so that they're relevant to us as teachers what values or character traits do I want to have as a teacher? I think that's a helpful question to ask ourselves. And then ask, how am I teaching with those values right now? And how can I teach with those values in the future? This helps this author revisit who he wants to be and consider how his practices are helping him be the type of person or in our case, the type of teacher he wishes to be. Kate, when you were teaching, did you ever have a situation where it was hard to teach with your values? Definitely. I think of um, those time constraints or those, um, uh, those ideas of trying to, the idea of trying to fit a lot of content in and feeling pressure to get your students to a certain level um, often got in the way of, of my teaching with my values. You know, it's, it can be tricky, but sometimes uh, I would just end up teaching less or planning to teach less content 
to make sure I had time to really check in with students and to care about them. And also to make sure that I had time to be creative and adjust when things weren't going well. So those are some definite things. But I think that time and curriculum piece can be a big pressure. In many ways, as teachers, we have a lot of control over what happens in our lessons. And so I kind of just said, well, I think they're going to understand a smaller amount of content better if I can connect with them and be creative. So that's kind of how I adjusted. I love that you weaved a bonus tip in there too, Kate. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's recap the strategies we learned today. We talked about co-creating class agreements. We talked about four ways to do that. Circle, smash it, chat waterfall, and write around. And of course, fifth to five with our consensus building or our agreement building as a class. We talked about building relationships regularly. So these are our values in action, that, that wall, that picture I showed you as well as circle. And we talked about a bonus plan for healthy conflict resolution through restorative conversation. And I'd love to hear from you. What is your plan? So which strategy do you want to use regularly in your instruction? And what's your plan to do it? How will you make it happen? Yeah, let us know, everybody. What is your plan? Which strategy will you regularly use? And it was wonderful today to see so many enthusiastic responses. Um, we have um, one comment from Jerex. American English has done it again. I love the ideas in this session. And I would say Lindsay Lyons has done it again. Great session from, from Lindsay. Wonderful. Let's see, um, Saliha says all the strategies are useful. However, teachers need to apply them in their classrooms to see which are most effective, absolutely. And you can you try them out and see if they work well and do them again or modify them, wonderful. Um, Natalia says these strategies are very important because students just try to make relationships at school and many of them are very shy, wonderful. All the strategies, oh, um, let's see here. Um, let's see, smash it an academic circle from Nayab, wonderful. Using the talking piece from Manuel, restorative conversations will be with me all the time from Joelma. Let's see, um, storytelling circle since my students love telling, telling and listening to stories from Len. I saw that Relo West Africa earlier said that they liked the academic circles, wonderful. And we of course have many, many people saying, I love all of the ideas and I will try to apply them. Maybe not all at once, but you can definitely try them and see what works in your classroom. These are so wonderful. There are so many more comments coming in. Um, thank you so much, everybody. All right, thank you. I just want to echo Kate. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful engagement throughout today's session. We did it. We went through all of our three goals. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. The final slide I have is just my references. So these are the research publications and resources, the one website and two books that I mentioned during the presentation. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. What a wonderful session today. And I hope for you, it for me, it was a great start to my day. Maybe for you, it's a great ending or close to ending for your day, depending on your time zone out there. We love uh, your wonderful enthusiasm today. It was great to hear from you. And Lindsay, thanks so much for presenting with us again and for sharing all of these really practical and engaging activities for our students to help us build an encouraging and um, reflective community of students so that they can feel that they belong and, and thrive in our classroom. So thank you so much.